Hey look, from this angle of Air Temple Island, you can see it kinda looks like the Southern Air Temple. Probably not a mistake by Aang. What's that fuzzy creature? That is a fire ferret, an arboreal mammal common to the bamboo forests of the Central Earth Kingdom. You ever wonder why it's called a fire ferret if they're from the Earth Kingdom? Just because they're red? If they're not breathing fire, that's just a red ferret. Milo does like a spinny air jump here to take off, which we've seen Aang do before. Thanks for sending the air acolytes to help us with the move. Why are you using this like sack to move this little stuff you have? You're not that poor, you have a gym bag, I've seen it. You're pretty. Can I have some of your hair? You know what, Milo? I don't think I like you very much. I have a couple questions. Is this an all-vegetarian island? Is that where you train airbending? Do we have to wear air acolyte clothes? Do we each get our own sky bison? And final question, how many trees are on this island? Yes, yes, no, no. 10,552. There's 10,000 trees on this island? Is this island not as small as it looks? Also, Bolin asked how many trees are on the island. He's so quirky. And Iggy already counted how many trees are on the island. She's so quirky. So where are we going to be staying? You're a boy. Boys have to stay on the boy's side. This is kind of like how the air temples used to work. The east and west temples were for women, and the north and south were for men. Interesting to see that Aang instilled a similar rule in this little microcosm of his culture. We shall meet again soon, beautiful woman. You know, I know the kid who actually voices Milo was really young at the time, but some of his lines are like, do you think they meant to have him slurring his words so hard because Milo the character is so young? Or is it just the outcome of having a really young voice actor? Asami, did you know Cora likes Mako? <laughs> Okay, okay, so this reaction face thing is really weird. In fact, Korra, the first season in general, has a weird thing about reaction faces. It feels almost like they were trying to get in on the blooming meme culture back in the day. It settles down, though, a lot after season one. It's still there, but a lot less prevalent. A lot more like it was back in Airbender. Hey! Run along, Iki! Oh. As you can see, there's even back-to-back -back ones here. Beifong's replacement, Sai Khan, is going to be inducted as the new chief of police later. I think we should both be there. It's strange how only jelly bean people showed up to psych on swearing in. It's not just me. That's weird, right? Councilman Tarlock, I will report directly to him. The police department will lend any and all available resources to the councilman and his task force. What is that weasel snake Tarlock up to now? No, Corey, he's a rat snake weasel. We've already covered this. You need me, but I don't need you. I'm the Avatar. You are not, in fact, the Avatar. You are merely a half-baked avatar in training. Tarlock continues to be the best part of the show and the only reason it ever moves forward. Once again, Korra's identity is threatened. This shit cuts so deep because her entire world is being the avatar and now it seems like Tarlock is playing on that insecurity as well. I'm still pretty sure Tarlock and Amon aren't the same guy though, but I'm sure this writing of Tarlock employing the same tactics as Amon just after Amon uses them over and over might be hard to catch on a first or second watch through. I still can't produce a single measly puff of air. I'm a failure. Aang not only had his bending teachers, but also his past lives to call upon for guidance. Have you ever made contact with your past lives? Mm, well, I get what you're getting at, Tenzin, but Aang called up the past avatars only on purpose the one time we got to see for moral guidance. And by that point, he had a solid handle on all of his bending. But even if he didn't, it would have felt weird if he went looking to his past lives for help. It wasn't like when they were floundering for a firebending teacher and could have been like, oh, I'll just call up Roku, he can teach me. Or even to a lesser extent, an earthbending teacher in Kyoshi. Korra needs to learn how to kick air, not a lecture on avatar philosophy. Of course I haven't. Didn't you get the memo from the White Lotus? I'm a spiritual failure too. I mean, if Korra was a spiritual failure, then what the hell was Aang? At least Korra can get random flashes. Aang had to do a whole fucking D&D &D side quest to get to a statue at the top of a tower on the correct day or else he was clueless. Aang seemed even more lost than Korra if you ask me, and I never got the vibe he was a failure. I had a few weird hallucinations. I saw Aang. It seemed like he was in trouble. Tenzin probably like, that don't sound like dad. He was never in trouble for long. That dude kicked ass. Nice little reflection in the water here. Could go unnoticed. <laughs> Don't lick the tears off, ugh. You know, this is weirdly only the second grossest Team Avatar animal licking moment. Mako, you really gotta figure out how torn up this scarf is and stick to it, man. People are starting to talk. And he wasn't alone. He had his friends to help him. Look, the arena might be shut down, but we're still a team! The new Team Avatar! Yuck, right? I mean, once again, I get it. They thought they only had one season. So, deeming themselves Team Avatar two-thirds the way through makes sense. But what, you guys only known each other for a few months, Max? Feels weird, doesn't it? But then when you think about it, really, the gang had only known each other for a few months too before Sokka coined Team Avatar. Toph had just barely joined. And the entire Airbender series takes place over the course of probably like nine or ten months. And Sokka said it about halfway through. Obviously, we had spent more screen time with our characters at that point 
point, and by the drill where Sokka coins it, Avatar had hit its stride and was an incredible show already. Team Avatar really felt like a team because they'd been all over the world, had a ton of adventures already, saved each other over and over and over. Like, they spent a lot of time together every day, working and adventuring and becoming friends. But these guys, they don't feel like Team Avatar yet, they're just a sports team. They haven't saved each other all that much, they haven't had any adventures, they honestly don't even feel like that close of friends. So having Team Avatar applied to these guys who, outside of Korra, I only really know some very basic character traits for, feels pretty lame. Yeah, let's do it! Let's ride. Now go away! Whoa. Whoa. Uh. Uh. Now, I'm not gonna say Appa is a way better companion than Naga and was intricately woven into the story as not only the pet of the team, but also as their main means of transportation, making him feel like truly a part of the team and an important one at that. And this shot of Naga perfectly encapsulates why Naga is none of those things and very forgettable. I'm not gonna say that. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. You know, I've been paying attention, and there's yet to be a scene of a car in Korra that didn't involve tire screeching. It's a weird observation, I know, but like, what the fuck are you here for if not weird observations? Always tire screeching, except for the one where it showed deadlock traffic. I'm actually going to point out the scenes where you don't hear a skirt, because there will be much fewer of those, I feel. I like the new Team Avatar style. On paper? Cool, yeah. I mean, everyone would like the idea of your cool young heroes ripping around town in a convertible. But really, all this does is show us that this is Asami's real role in the team. She is the oppa of Korra's team avatar. It's set up so perfectly. Unit 216, cancel that 1058 at Harmony Tower. Come back to the station, over. My dad had police scanners installed in all of his cars. I guess now I know why. You never questioned that? Hello? Jailbreak at headquarters. Officers down. Electrocuted. Electrocuted in the sense that, you know, dead? Because honestly, all right, let's take the time to talk about that now. I know you can't show people getting their head caved in by rocks or horribly burned by fire. Fair. But when Amon, this upstart violent revolutionist, a threat we're supposed to be taking very seriously, has his goons using electricity as their main form of attack, it kind of hamstrings his scariness factor if he only has his goons set the voltage to knock people out. Wouldn't someone like Amon, who was at the point of bombing buildings being more than okay with just setting his electricity to kill? Okay, maybe not on the taser gloves, you think. Those are just tasers, sure. But what about the battle mech suits? Why are those seemingly only built to stun and immobilize as well? Is Amon not willing to kill to get what he wants? If you think about these little things, it makes Amon seem much less frightening as a villain. I repeat, level four alert. Equalist jailbreak. Skirt! That's them! Let's get him! Why did this truck freak out? He was coming to an intersection anyway, and there's no stoplights. He would have had to stop regardless. The fact that he was going as fast as he was is kind of messed up. This is one of the things that Korra's new setting can really take advantage of. You'd never be able to see something like this in the original show. A car chase with bending involved? Seems like a pretty gangbusters idea to me. This is awesome. And even though we don't get much of it, still a pretty cool idea. Alright, so I've been looking for the right opportunity to get into this little point about electricity bending. It can definitely be used as a cop-out for needing the firebender to feel effective. Like right here, if Mako hit this dude with a fireball, he's not defending himself, and it would have to be serious enough for him to fall off the bike, so he'd probably be burned. And we don't really want to show one of our heroes burning someone. So alright, just hit the bike with a quick little zap. It's electricity, and the viewers don't have a solid grasp on how strong anything involving electricity is. So they could just make it do whatever they want, basically. There was a big problem of this in the comics as well, where lightning got all sorts of different things done to it. So much so that it was basically interchangeable with firebending, and in some parts even weaker than firebending. Zuko took a direct lightning strike to his chest once and literally got up and said, I'm fine. By making it more versatile and more usable, you make it less cool and less special. <laughs> what is this, not poison smoke? Why isn't it green? Help me out, we gotta make this turn! No, let me show you how that would actually go. Help me out! We gotta make this turn! Asami! Jesus, you are like Appa. You were just ready to murder these guys. Oh, oh, ah! There's like at least one or two more extra hit sounds in here compared to the animation, right? Oh, oh, ah! Korra, a little help here, yeah? Just want to point out that during the entire time their car was boarded, all Korra did was pull Mako back into his seat. 
see, we can't have Mako light this dude on fire, or else he's a bad guy, and it would be horrifying to watch. But we can zap him, because as far as we know in this show, electricity maxes out at the point where you just go and fall over. Probably could have just, like, left the criminals in the truck, right? You didn't have to take them out for the photo shoot. What you did was tear up the city and impede the real authorities in their pursuit of these criminals. If it wasn't for Team Avatar... They would have gotten away. She's right, it was a team effort, considering all Korra did herself during the whole action scene was build two ramps. I guess you kind of need to give your other characters time to shine in their first, like, vigilante outing, but come on, let Korra feel like she's involved in the fight at least. Is it just me or do these things have mad handling? What the hell? The law I have proposed would make it illegal for anyone to be a member of the Equalists or even be associated with them. All right, fair enough. They blew up the arena. It also puts into effect a curfew ensuring all non-benders are in their own homes by nightfall. No, now you're just being cartoonishly evil for the sake of it. Tenzin, you know you're fighting an uphill battle here because Tarlock has said the most recent thing. All available units, please respond to the 5600 block of Dragon Flats Borough. The Dragon Flats Borough is the same area that Tarlock busted in and broke up that chi blocking training. Tonight, we will execute a raid on an underground chi blocker training camp located in the Dragon Flats Borough. Consider them armed and dangerous. Proceed with caution. I call front! Bolin got his seatbelt on fast. That dude is ready. After you. What a gentleman. Thanks. I don't think this is even that bad. Relax, Asami. Man, this love triangle. Why is the, the power, power out? Oh, hey, Cora, you're doing voiceover too? Why is the crowd like very clearly upset and then this dude just turns and screams? Oh, yeah! Yeah! Is he excited? Is he stupid? Please help us. You're our avatar too! Cora, but deeper? What are you doing here? Okay, so we finally get to see some benders oppressing non-benders. Good for story purposes, but it doesn't at all accomplish what I whined about a couple episodes back. These non-benders are only being bullied and taken advantage of now because of the power that Psychon and Tarlock have. Power that they got, like, today-ish. As far as I've been shown, this is the first time anything like this has ever happened. And this is well after a mon started blowing shit up. You don't have the right to treat these innocent people like criminals. This is an equalist rally. There's nothing innocent about it. They're not equalists. They're just normal people who want their rights back. They are the enemy. All right, so Tarlock is taking things to the extreme, holding all non-benders accountable for the actions of a few. Once again, much like Amon. These parallels are very much on purpose, and that's what I believe the title of this episode is referring to, when extremes meet. Amon's extremist actions on one side, and Tarlock's extremist actions on the other. <laughs> There ain't no way you're fitting that many people in those trucks. This here, this is very rare footage. This is Korra directly overpowering someone else's bending and making them stop. That's, to my knowledge, never shown before this at all. Whenever someone bends someone else's bending, it's traveled enough so that your brain is pretty sure it's just a projectile now. And now the person doing the bending of the bending is just bending it second. But here, these rocks are very clearly being maintained in the air and Korra just forces them down. Never before seen shit. Where does this water come from? It comes up from the ground off screen, but the ground looks pretty dry. There's like a light scattering of dry snow. Definitely not enough to just whip up a water tendril though, in my head at least. Let her go. Arrest him and his brother. Where's the hole for the other rock? And that hole is way too far away from her compared to where she pulled the earth out from. We'll be all right. You know, Bolin gets stuffed into the back of trucks a lot in this show. It happens even more than just these two. So sad to see your little team avatar broken up. You had a good run. Yeah, it was like eight minutes and 10 seconds. It was pretty solid. Take them away. <laughs> I came as fast as I could. That's a funny line coming from Tenzin, who we saw just leisurely stroll in when we know he can glide and probably run super fast. All Equalist suspects are being detained indefinitely. They'll be freed if and when the task force deems they are no longer a threat. Those people are entitled to due process under the law. You'll have to take that up with Councilman Tarlock. Oh, I plan to. I mean, the people that used to say Korra is darker and more mature were right about one thing. I could not imagine this conversation happening in Airbender. But the thing is, is that you could throw around all these really important sounding words, but it doesn't change the fact that these politics aren't nuanced in the slightest. Tarlock is just straight up evil for his own gain. And while I can fuck with a villain on that level, don't get me wrong, I don't think it really fits the councilman, plotting, scheming, politician type that this show that's trying to be more adult was going for. You goddamn, do you know how long it's been since we've had a proper crescent moon and 
Avatar, not since the waterbending master back in book one of Airbender, and before that it was season one episode seven of that show. This is season one episode eight of Korra, this is the third crescent moon. Wake up Naga. Naga sleeps in your room? Seems like she actually might like the cold outdoors to me, I don't know why I get that vibe. You and I need to talk. What? I can't hear you over the very nice waterfall backdrop your office has. It's, cra it's crashing water. It's actually very loud. What? Tarlock just likes crescent moon shapes? What, guys? I can't be a bloodbender. Look at all my crescent moon merch. I hate the full moon, actually. You're doing exactly what Amon says is wrong with benders. You're using your power to oppress and intimidate people. And you don't? Right? Isn't that what you came here to do? intimidate me into releasing your friends? Well, yes, on that level as well. But before tonight, as far as I could tell, Korra was the biggest problem in the city on that account. <laughs> Korra's hair gets slashed here, just like Tarlock's desk. Oh, and Azula's hair, remember that? I give Tarlock and the creators credit. This idea for him having a waterfall in his office as both an aesthetic choice and as a weapon is a really cool idea. How the like plumbing and water supply would work for it might be kind of a lot though for a government building. Pretty cool slow-mo at least for once, except this jump. This jump is really clunky. She just kind of twirls and nothing hits her. But this, this one's cool, but also at least one of Korra's knuckles are totally broken after that, right? <laughs> The water naturally stops flowing over the walls, Korra does this really cool move, but then in the next shot, water still seems to be flowing over it, despite being not connected to any kind of water source anymore. Tarlock definitely gets hit, so he will go face first into the wall here, but then when he goes through the wall, he's facing the other way. What are you gonna do now? You're all out of water, pal. What are you gonna do now? Kill him? What's your win condition here? He's a city councilman. You're in trouble for just breaking in through his window, let alone fighting him and busting up the place. <laughs> So wait, hold on. I know this is a big bloodbending reveal, but Korra thought Tarlock was totally helpless here, right? She was just gonna immolate him? Burn him? Jesus Christ. You can't tell me you don't have the earthbending skills to just immobilize him when he's down on his ass like this. It's not a full moon. Don't. Don't. Just fucking don't. Yes, they very cleverly showed a crescent moon a minute ago, but just fucking don't with me. I mean, I know it's a pretty cheap loss. She got jump scared by bloodbending, but put it in the Korra loss column. Say goodbye to Republic City, Avatar Korra. You'll never see it again. Oh hey, Korra can breathe fire too. You know, that's pretty rare. We only ever saw the royal family in Angdu in an airbender. Fire breath is rarer than being able to shoot electricity out of your fingers now. All right, When Extremes Meet is a better episode than the last one for sure, but I'm not sure if that makes it a good one. It somehow feels really slow despite having a car chase and a big throwdown at the end. I feel like in this one, you really notice how claustrophobic the world is feeling in this series. Maybe it's just because of the dawn of the new team avatar. Maybe it's just because in the back of your brain, you start to realize that without the pro bending arena, there's only really three settings scenes take place in, Air Temple Island, City Hall, and the vague, uninteresting, empty streets of Republic City. No really good character work gets done, despite everyone getting a decent amount of screen time. Even though last episode was bad, at least we developed Asami a decent chunk, you know? Here all that moves forward is the level on which Tarlock and Korra don't like each other, which moves from not very much at all to what the fuck? And that's pretty much the whole episode. It's saved by some interesting action and a cool twist, but other than that, an unimpressive one if you ask me. Page of shoutouts if you want to see the next two episodes of Overanalyzing Korra ahead of the YouTube release. You can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shout out to all, go to my top patrons, Aurora, who found an anthill and became their god. They even have Aurora Church on Sundays. Balmere Candle, who donated all of their ridiculous amount of hair to make wigs for sick kids, and then also put a gift card for the Cracker Barrel in each one. Dragon Shifter, who played Jenga with real steel eye beams, and there were only three fatalities, and I'd call that a win. Gene Cree, who was just fucking around on an edge sketch last Monday and accidentally drew the meaning of life. Jacob1908, who was the first person to play Moonlight Sonata on Keita, and have all the high society snobs say, you know what, that's pretty good. Lemon, who pays a dude to set up a different deadly trap in their house every day, really wakes them up in the morning. Omega Fighter, who can make new Coke, old Coke, and Coke Classic into Coke Future. Sean Martin, who was just messing around doing some animal calls in the woods, and he did one wrong accidentally, and long story short, he's friends with a forest kaiju now. Tater of Tots, who has a photocopier memory. If you have a photographic memory, they can make copies of your memories. The Pacifist Warrior, who attended the Goblin Summit, and finally got them all to agree, no more goblining past 9pm on weekdays. Fine. Finally. Tiago Nascimento, who much like sharks need to keep moving or they'll die, he needs to keep being fucking sweet or else he'll die. And William Fisher, who can't actually steal your soul, but his collection of 200 plus souls would lead me to believe he's pretty persuasive. And of course my other fuck you money patrons, Der 50 Kobold, Kristen, Kyrie Walsh, Laferg 13, Roman J. Kopp, Stephanie Riches, The 1am Party, Thomas Lautenbach, Whit Rowe, and Jean Waifu. And my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, 9Y2Y, Ethereal Catnip, Alan Garvin, Andrew Watchard, Austin Gallup, Black Smith, 
Meme, Blue Food, Bob Def, Carlo Ren, Chandler Crump, Kobe Smith, Dead Rat Fiasco, Deathly Healer, Dizzy Pain, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Donut, Distant, Emma Not Emma, Aaron Grace, Gianluca, Leandro Magi, JL, Jada Jones, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Justin Wells, Kai D, Kelly, Lord of Mordor, Mac, my mans, Medium D Speaks, Misaki Ito, Nick, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Potato Scream, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Gregorikos, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatz, Sean Flowers, Super Snipper, The Long and Short of It, Thiefy Mole, Tom Cooper, Thomas Graff, Turt Bobs, and some sort of bear face. Next up, we meet up with some old friends.